Chains be broke right now in the name of Jesus. Hearts be mended right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Healing in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, as we approach this throne of grace, saying, Yahweh, the Most High God, you are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing sits by you, Lord. You are the God that is not far, but you are near to the brokenhearted. You are near to the wounded. You are near to the orphan. You are near to the widow. You are near. So, Lord, we ask that you continue having your way throughout the rest of this service. Anoint the man of God to speak a word in season. Touch his vocal cords that he will be clearly speaking, free of any issues, Lord. Lord, we pray and say thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for what you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Before you see this, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Thank you for being a trooper today. You may be seated. Say, PJ, what do you mean? Because some people, they come, they say, they saw that rain out there, and they went straight to YouTube. <laughs> Mama Winans, thank you so much. Thank you. See, it's special and dear because I don't have too many people I can tell, talk to to tell on my dad. So when my dad acts up, I got my mother, I got Mama Winans. And one time my dad wasn't feeling well. I said, Daddy, you need to go home. And Cece was here, my favorite on um, Winans. I'm sorry, BB, you know that. <laughs> and now Angie's moving up. So you, you, you're going lower and lower because of the way you treat me, my brother. <laughs> Don't underestimate what the, the man of God can speak. <laughs> Look, might give, me, might give me a word in season just for you, BB. <laughs> but thank you so much for all you've done uh, the Winans family the legacy um, it means a lot to me thank you thank you and, for, and, and I'm going to say this I'm going to be bold saying this especially for people of color thank you for showing a level of excellence as you move throughout the, you know, the legacies and all the stuff you did but you did good with BB you know, we, we still work with him but you did good with him all right? I, I, Angie's a blessing, but you know, we... But uh, let me hurry up and get off the stage because my dad got a word for you, a word in season. Um, Dr. Renard is going to be at Carnegie Hall Saturday, December 9th. It's uh, the, an Irish Christmas concert. Uh, it starts at 7.30. Tickets are available online. But today I'm going to give some tickets away, right? And, you know, just to hold you accountable, we're going we're gonna to go, whose birthday's today, in the balcony. Because the balcony always gets left out. And the brother came to me and said, he said, Pastor Jamal, stop forgetting about the balcony. So I, I'm, I'm, we, we hook up the balcony uh, orchestra. It's, I'm, don't get jealous. So if you're in the balcony and your birthday's today, we, I, I'm going to give you two tickets for Carnegie Hall. I, oh, we got one, two, three. And, and, and I, I need to see some ID. I'm just holding you accountable. <laughs> no, we, you got, we got um, um, uh, ushers in the balcony. Uh, if your birthday say you got one, two, three birthdays today, you can go see. Where's my, uh, where's my represents? Four birthdays. Okay, we're going to get four out. Pastor Bernard, can I get four out? C cover them all, co yep. all? The whole CCC? No, no, no. <laughs> Coming for all things, he's gonna, gonna have an Oprah moment. Look under your no, chair. No, 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 you no, get no. a ticket, and you get a ticket, and you get a ticket. <laughs> he bringing me back. He's... <laughs> no, so we'll cover you. You're in the balcony. It's your birthday. You stood.
We got you. I think I saw like four or four or six. Okay. Yeah. So my Good. Do- the service reps. Our staff. The service your hand. She's there in the balcony, right there in the middle. You see the, the the service reps. Go see the service reps. You know you gotta get your ticket today. Well, not today. We're gonna put you get your name. We're gonna get you hooked up. Yeah. We'll make sure. Okay, so what's happening is I was called by Keith Getty and his organization. They've been doing it every year for about 10 years now. And a, a, did did uh, you just fire me from doing the announcement? He just fired me. Let me see. I had the Getty. I was going to talk about that. So you what were you going to say? That, that you hooked you. Don't forget to announce the, the bookstore sale. Okay. The bookstore sale. Thank you. I got fired, everybody. I can't give too many tickets out. So, uh, they've been doing it for 10 years, and it's just been an amazing, I don't know if you're familiar with Irish culture and the Irish Christmas. Karen, Pastor Karen and I used to go to uh, Radio City Music Hall to see the Irish dance. Absolutely amazing. So I got a call, and he asked if I would come and do a seven-minute uh, sermonette within the context of the evening about Christmas. And I said, man, Keith, I would love to, so let's make it happen. So I'll be there in concert, and uh, we're looking to have a, a great, great time in the Lord. Amen? So please, keep it in your prayers. Uh, you've got the information about it. Also, and there's a sale in our bookstore December 9th, which is next Saturday from 11 to 2 after service on Sunday as well. Uh, Please avail yourself of all the deals that will be made available to you. Uh, Did I miss anything? I'm good? BB is telling me whether I missed anything. Okay, but I like that. That means he's home. Okay, so sign language. <laughs> okay, so um, how many of you were here last Sunday? Okay, so I've got to do part two. Can I do part two? Yes. You sure? Yes. So we're going to dig in. We're going we're gonna... to... I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want, to see... I want you to say, neighbor, we are people of the book. I want you to grab another neighbor. Say, neighbor, we are people of the book. Now, the Jews were called that early on because of their dedication to the scripture and their surrender to the scripture to be their source of faith and their rule of conduct. This book has taken a lot of abuse over the last several decades in our nation. And I'm holding a hard copy. I still like to feel the leather and smell it, even though I have 32 translations on my phone. But it still goes back to the point that we are people of the book. The Bible is still the best-selling book in the world. The numbers tell the story, all right? It's still the best-selling book in the world. It's also the most shoplifted book in the world. I say, let them have it. You want to steal a Bible? Keep it. I'll just write that off, right? Just write it off. But it has shaped and defined so much of human society. There are over 2 billion Christians in the world right now who call Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior, who believe not just in the historical Jesus, but in the living Savior who came into human history. And it is amazing how Jesus said it would all begin with just a a, a little seed in seed form. He called it a mustard seed. The mustard seed is not the smallest seed in in, in the world, but it is a symbol of starting small and having uh, developed over time into something much greater. And it's just baffling when you look back and see that a group of 11 11 men, a handful of women, in an obscure place in the Roman Empire could start a movement that within the first 400 years actually became the state religion of Rome and 30 million people would subscribe to this newfound faith. It was amazing. Within the first 100 years, there was persecution. They went through a lot. But 
Christianity continued to grow and shape human culture in ways that we never imagined, in arts, entertainment, uh, law, ethics, uh, in many, many different ways. What I want to do, continuing part two of last week, is just give you a frame to understand where we are and the forces that are at work. And if I were to lay this out, which I'd like to do, um, let me do it this way. And I want you to, we're going to approach the Bible, the whole book, we're going to approach the whole book very quickly, as from the perspective of redemptive history. Redemptive history. What kind of history? Yes, redemptive history. So it's, it's history, but in the light of redemption. The original intent in the mind of God as revealed in scripture, because we, we have a revealed religion, a revealed truth, is human flourishing. The creation of a species called humanity, and that that species should flourish and be imagers of the eternal God. That was a plan. That was a plan. The book of Genesis was not intended to be a scientific discussion of how matter, time, space was created or exacted or formed or shaped, etc. But it was to be a simple and yet very powerful declaration of Genesis 1.1. And that is, in the beginning of time, space, continuum, God created. How many of you have gotten that far in your Bible reading? <laughs> how many of you believe, I asked you this last week, how many of you fully subscribe to that first opening verse? Fully subscribe. And all of its implications. Because you fully subscribe means you also all right, subscribe to all of his implications. It has social, political implications, identity implications. It goes on and on and on in terms of what it implies about history, about humanity, on and on and on. So how many of you believe, how many of you fully subscribe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? That's the starting point. I got 10 people on board. Let me keep working on you. I want consensus here, all right? How many of you embrace Genesis 1-1 as the truth? Yeah. See, there's a lot to work out in between. But we have to have a starting point. And that starting point embraces that there is a supreme being, a first cause, a causeless cause who set in motion what we understand as this material, physical, visible universe that we experience, time, space, matter. It began with God. He created it. Now, the seven days of creation, we're not going to get into all of that uh, because it was never intended to be a scientific explanation of that beginning because the Hebrew language is more so not how he did it molecularly or on any scientific level, but how it was all organized. It was all about order. So if I were to carefully paraphrase it, in the beginning, God ordered the universe. You need to write that down. This is important. Because all of the culture wars and the things that we experience, especially anti-religion and anti-Christianity, so is, is, is steeped in this notion that we know better how the universe, especially humanity, should be organized. So we rebel against the order of God. If, essentially, sin in all of its manifestations is simply, and I'm careful with that word simply, a rebellion against divine order and divine authority. No matter how it manifests itself. If God says, this is the way I've organized things. This out of my authority is what I declare. And you have to choose. 
And boy, that word choose is so powerful. In my relationship with Islam for a period of time, some five years before becoming a Christian, there was an interesting distinction that was made in one movie called The Kingdom of Heaven. And it was a line in the movie, and I said, wow, this is, this is so true. Islam says, their prophet says, submit. Jesus said, choose. And there's a difference between telling someone to submit and telling someone to choose. Because when you tell someone to choose, you recognize their freedom to do so. You honor them, you give them value, you give them esteem. And essentially, and I'm not making a comparison now carefully between Islam and Christianity, but I'm talking about two different spirits that drive religious belief systems. And within Christianity, it is about dominion, not domination. And what we're seeing play out in the world is the tension between good and evil, but also the tension between two spirits, the spirit of dominion and the spirit of domination. The spirit of dominion recognizes the freedom of the entity and accepts responsibility to guide, to guard, to govern, to identify the gifts, talents, and abilities and develop those gifts, talents, and abilities toward the common good and a human flourishing. The spirit of domination says, conquer, subdue, control, exploit, dominate, deceive, promise to serve and please, but your desire is to enslave and dominate. The distinction is clear. When Jesus said, I'm come that you might have and that you might have it more abundantly. Is that what he said? Amen. Amen. He said, I came that you may, he also said, he said, is your father's, heavenly father's desire that you bear fruit, much fruit, and that your fruit should remain. You've heard this, we talked about occupy, what does occupy mean? It means be productive while maintaining fidelity to Jesus. Productivity and fidelity. Max, making maximum use of your gift, talents, and abilities toward a common good. We have purpose, we have meaning. That is the spirit of dominion. So when he says, be fruitful, multiply, have what? Dominion. Dominion does not look to enslave, it looks to liberate. And that's why Jesus said, choose. Amen? Amen. The moment you give me that power, you're recognizing my dignity, you're respecting me as a human entity. But when I look to impose my power and influence, to manipulate and exploit to the benefit of one over the other, now we're talking the spirit of domination. And that's how good and evil is playing out in human society. And guess what? Christians can be guilty of exercising domination instead of dominion. Come on, 600 years of imperialism. Help me, help me here. Let's call it what it is, right? Okay, colonization, you name it, around the world. But the truth of Christianity will always rise above the fallacies, the twisting, the manipulation of Christianity. Because you can tr manipulate the truth, but so long before the truth pushes back and emerges to shine itself to see what it actually is. And sometimes you have to let both grow together, Jesus said, and wait for a harvest where the truth will be revealed and the lie also uncovered. Oh, this is good preaching, boy. I'm having fun. Are you hearing me? So we're looking at the grander scheme of things as we as believers. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders for not walking with a prophetic awareness. He said, you can tell the weather but you can't tell the signs of the times. We should not be guilty of that. We should walk in a prophetic awareness that there are things going on around us. We live in a parallel universe, parallel worlds. There's a spiritual, the natural, the visible, the invisible. Amen? And Jesus is Lord over all. We're talking about the same Jesus. So when we go to the scriptures, all right, 
We need a lens with which you understand how it's all unfolding. So one of the perspectives, because there is systematic theology, the biblical theology, that looks at the stories and the development of the stories and the cultures, and systematic theology breaks it apart into themes like, like uh, ecclesiology, uh, harmatiology, about sin, different doctrines. But we're looking at redemptive history. So if we look at the Bible with redemptive history, the book, all right, it begins with creation, introducing the God of creation. And when it was penned, it was a polemic, it was a pushback against in existing cosmogenies. Because in, 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 in the ancient world, there were all these stories about how the world began. Usually with all these gods fighting each other, killing each other, having offspring. And at the end of the day, humans always became the slaves of the gods. But what was different with this revelation? No. Humans came from one supreme God who created them and elevated them to a place of dignity, not slavery. So we begin with creation. And then all of a sudden, you know it doesn't take long, humans long to mess stuff up, right? So by chapter 3, what do we got? Yeah, there we go. And not only to mess it up, but to make it worse, by chapter 6, violence filled the earth. But in chapter 3, verse 15 of Genesis, we have what is called a redemptive promise. And essentially, it reads, we can get it up on the screen, ESV, where God is speaking judgment to his audience. There's a serpent, there's Eve. There's Adam, and basically, Genesis 3.15, 3.15, ESV, on my screen, I will put enmity, he's setting the stage, God is setting the stage, for the conflict between good and evil and redemptive history. I will put enmity, hostility, between you, the serpent, and the woman, and the language is more specific to the serpent, and yet we don't know the identity of the serpent clearly revealed in Scripture until the book of Revelation. There are hints along the way, but a clear tie back to this individual comes up in Revelation 12. We see this, 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 this deceiver, Satan, the Satan, we see all these references to it, but with great clarity, Revelation 12 unfolds it. Or should I say, uncovers it. And that's why Revelation is called the unveiling. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who is this woman? When is this woman? These are questions that are left open. How many know God can just throw something at you and then see you in 10 years? <laughs> Ask Abraham. First revelation, he was 70. Second was 75. The next, he was 85. Then after that, he was 99. How many of us I'm talking about? So, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. So we have two lineages of humans coming into existence that will be under the influence of one of these individuals. The offspring of the woman and, of course, the offspring of the serpent. He, which identifies this offspring as a male individual, a male human being who will come in to human society and human history, will bruise your head. And bruising the head of the serpent, that's how you kill a serpent. You crush it by the head, right? And he, and, and, and I'm sorry, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And of course, the old idea of the Achilles tendon, a place of weakness, which Jesus surrendered himself in such a way that he took on the sins of all of us. And in that weakness of humanity, he died on the cross. I'm speaking as though they knew, but they didn't know what we know. We look back in hindsight. And we're able to understand the language. But essentially, this was a promise that a messianic figure would be introduced into human history. And that messianic figure would be the redemptive agent of God to restore humanity to the original vision of human flourishing and the Edenic model. Eden restored. How many understand that? So now this has to play out. So the next phase within, within the biblical narrative is preparation. Things have to now be prepared for 
this messianic figure for this redemptive promise. And this period of preparation takes us through uh, the flood of Noah, the Tower of Babel, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the establishment of a national entity called Israel, the rebellion of human society against God, God allowing them to break up into various nations and develop over time. We studied these verses last week. Right up to the last prophet, Malachi. So preparation takes us right through the Old Testament to the end of the book of Malachi, and now the gospel of Matthew appears, and it is time for the redemptive promise to be manifested. So we will call that manifestation. The Christ is manifested. He appears. God incarnates in human form. Emmanuel, God with us. The only begotten, unique son of living God makes his appearance. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us and we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Within that preparation, there was a need to call a man Abraham, take time throughout of his genealogy, bring forth a, a, a Jacob. Out of Jacob would come tribes. Out of that would be organized around a, a, a set of laws under the leadership of Moses. Moses would move on to Joshua, Joshua into the judges, the judges into the, the, the kings and the prophets and the priesthood. I mean, there was just so much that goes into this period, which covers some 2,100 years. Because the time from the fall to the, uh, the flood is about 1,656 years. So we're talking about a lot of time that is passing for God to do his thing. And see, that's why I've learned to be patient in my prayers. Because I never know what God has to put in place in order to respond to one of my prayers. And if he's got to deal with some people, that can take a minute. Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know. So once once the Genesis 3.15 promise is manifested, here, we, here he is, front and center. And he declares, repent, change, for the kingdom of heaven has come. And he brings it to the very people that came out of the individual Abraham that he called out of polytheistic society to reveal himself and to establish this continuation. And this is why, this is why one of the key reasons that God preserved the Jewish people, never mind the state of Israel, preserved the Jewish people for more than 3,000 years under constant threat of genocide and annihilation is because of his plan and his covenant. In Romans chapter 11, around verse 26, 28, Paul reminds, he said, look, God has not forsaken Israel as a people, all right? Because the state of Israel didn't exist then. He didn't forsake them as a people because God wants to demonstrate that no matter how much time passes, he is a covenant-keeping God. If he said it, he's going to do it. Very, very important. So he would have a remnant reminder of that original agreement that he made. Would this be in conflict with the new covenant? Absolutely not. But there are those who want to Get into that. We don't have the time to get into that today. But suffice it to say that the Jewish people, as a remnant of a covenant that he made with Abraham, would continue through him human history right up to the consummation of the age. So the language. So after Jesus came, he lived, he preached, he demonstrated his authority, he died on the cross for our sins, he rose from the dead, and now he left it to his disciples to spread the word. And that is the period of propagation. The spreading of the word. Propagation. And if I were to, 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 to set this up, creation, of course, Genesis 1 and 2, the fall, Genesis 3, redemptive promises, 3.15, and from, from 3.15 on 
to, to, to the last chapter and verse of Malachi is the preparation, the manifestation of the four gospels, the propagation of the book of Acts, and then we get into Romans, which we begin the epistles, and it's called the explanation because Jesus didn't explain much. And it's not until the writings of Paul and some of the other apostles that we begin, begin to unpack this theology, that we learn about the body of Christ, that we learn about spiritual warfare in, 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 in our, uh, in our uh, resp area of responsibility. So the epistles begin to really unpack and explain this message of the gospel. And of course, after that, there's the book of Revelation, which deals with the consummation of the age or the completion of God's plan of redemption. Can I check off some things? Check. Day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Daniel. That in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How many read that? Acts, Acts chapter 2, right? He talks about the prophetic visions, dreams. It goes back to Jesus saying, I will build my church, which is a, 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 a collection of individuals surrendered to his authority and his message and submitted to his lordship, Right? The consummation simply means the completion of all things, how it's all going to end, how it's all going to come together. And that's why Revelation is so important, and there's a lot of symbolic language there that we will not get lost in, but I'll try to make it simple for you so you can capture the, the essence of it. So when do the last days begin? On the day of Pentecost, according to Scripture. Now, there are those who would like to find out where we are on the timetable, and they look at what's happening, where we are in the year 2023, and we, they say, this must be the last of the last days. I haven't found that in the Bible. <laughs> but you can use it if, if, if you can think, and we think linear, right? We think linear. We're moving, you know, along a line of progress toward a particular end, a particular moment, you know, and please don't get caught up in trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. He says it's going to be like a thief. And if a thief calls you to announce, I'm coming to your house tonight. <laughs> Give me a break. Right? He said, no man knows the hour, nor the day, when the Son of Man returns. Right? And he gave us specific orders not to sit and worry about when he's going to come back. He said, Make sure two things. You're being productive with your life in a way that honors God, right? And brings his love, life, and light to the world. And secondly, that you're remaining faithful to him. Because you can be very productive and become loyal to other stuff. You can end up with other gods in your life. And there are Christians who are wrestling through that right now. They're very productive. But it's obvious that they walked away from fidelity to Jesus. And then you could be the other side of the coin where you're very faithful to Jesus. Go to church every day, read your Bible, do all things. But you haven't done squat to make a difference in the world. You're going to be judged for both. You're going to be judged for both. Were you productive? Well done. Good. But also faithful servant. Were you productive? And did you remain loyal to Jesus? Amen. So as we think about this, Revelation sets the stage, and it's not like the language, this eschatological language or prophetic language is only in that book. No, it's dispersed throughout the scripture. But focusing directly at the end of the first century, the apostle John writes, as we give him credit for it, writes, and he unveils. And chapters 12 and 13 are critical chapters because of what it expresses in symbolic language. And we want to understand how it breaks down. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. Hey, I want to make sure. So I just walk you through the whole Bible. Do you know that? Yeah. You have got a frame into which you can take what you're reading and understand where it fits. So all that you read in the Old Testament and all the things that took place, you know it's all part of the preparation. Again and again, 
the people through whom he would bring Messiah were under the threat of annihilation. Why? Because you make an announcement to the devil that there's going to be a, a, a human male offspring that's going to take you out. What does the devil start doing? Oh, yeah. He starts watching. He starts watching what God is doing and the development of humanity. And he tries to corrupt it. He began immediately with Cain. Thinking that maybe Cain is the offspring. So let me intercept him. Undermine him. And thereby interrupt the possibility of my own downfall. So Satan has been worried about his downfall for a long time. And that's why God had to work behind the scenes. Because if you tell folks, they'll just blab it out. So there are a lot of things that God did along the way that he didn't share. The way the prophets spoke. The literary language that they use, the symbolism that they use, again and again, it was so coded. Look, if we get frustrated reading it today, can you imagine how they did? But it was brilliant the way the Lord God laid all of this out and to see it come to pass. Knowing that we would reach back in time and history now through the lens of Jesus Christ and this revelation and make sense of it all. So when we get to Revelation chapter 12, and we see this sign in heaven. I want you to capture this. We see a shift in the conflict between good and evil. And whenever there's a shift between the cosmic conflict between good and evil, you will read language like, and the stars fell to the earth. Look, one star gets close enough, we're dead. So it's not like stars can fall down here and, you know, look, our sun, we get too close. We evaporated, right? So it's, it's metaphoric language, and the stars were used throughout Scripture to identify spiritual beings, glorified spiritual beings. I'm talking about angelic beings, those who are in power, positions of power and influence. When the moon uh, is darkened and the sun is darkened, all of that is language that we do not take literally, folks. We don't turn it into a blood moon or, or an eclipse or anything like that. We understand that it's the language, it's, a, it's apocalyptic language, but it's also language that simply expresses a radical shift in the power structure in the cosmos. Because God established a hierarchy in the cosmos that we are not even fully understanding of in a realm of existence that transcends our own. Because he made us a little lower than the angels. Amen? Amen. But with very strict uh, restrictions upon who we are, how we function, what we do. But there are beings that are superior to us in existence. So, let's go to chapter 12, all right? Verse 1, Revelation. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And a great sign appeared where? Where? Come on, talk back to me or I'll quit. Where? In heaven. What appeared? A woman, a woman. And the identity of this woman has been debated over the years, scholars back and forth. If you're Catholic, you're going you're gonna to make her Eve, Mary, um, Israel. I think I got everybody. But within the text, there is certainty within, within the description. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the, what? Come on. Sun, right? With the moon. Where? under her feet and on her head a crown of six stars what does 12 remind you of the 12 tribes of israel right and this language you will find in genesis in a dream that joseph had concerning his family you go back and look at it all right the woman was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. What is she giving birth to? Come on, what's the woman giving birth to? And the only woman has a, 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 an entity that gave birth. Jesus was born a Jew. So it has to be the nation of Israel at least here. That is this woman who was impregnated and now she's bringing forth a Messiah. And it's in turmoil because remember at the announcement of the birth of Jesus, remember the killing of the innocents? Remember the babies were killed? 
all of that surrounded. There was violence surrounded, surrounding his coming into the earth. And Jesus was coming in undercover. There was no big announcement. It was an obscure village called Bethlehem. Out of reach. Purposely, intentionally so. But calling attention to the grand event by the wise men who came to see him. But first, of course, they met with Herod and, you know, the whole power structure was threatened now because he's the king of the Jews, assigned by the Roman government. Who could this other person be? So Jesus enters with his violence. He enters into violent society to counteract violence, to break the cycle of violence because violence filled the earth from Genesis 6. Amen? Amen. And you can't break the cycle of violence with violence. You can only break it with grace. So he was willing through his grace to absorb the violence within human history and in a human species on a cross. He absorbed it all. And that's how he destroyed and broke the power of Satan. What is he going to do? And this is not a la Matrix, folks. For those of you who are Matrix fans. She was crying in agony, but she gave birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red what? Red what? Dragon. With seven heads and ten horns. Horns are simply indications of power. Usually political power. In fact, the, the expression to lift the horn means to make a, a public display of your power. It goes back to the language of Daniel. If you read Daniel chapter 7, you'll read about horns and crowns. And you'll also read, as, as, as you will in chapter 13, about the leopard, the bear, the lion. These are all symbols that John took from Daniel, who was looking forward to the coming of Messiah. And seven diadems, all right? regions of authority his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth and this we apply all right consistently i don't have time to go through it to the angelic beings that supported the rebellion there is a rebellion here that has taken place right cast into the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to what give birth so that when she bore her child he might devour it See, and that's, that's the genius of it. All right? If he was all that, he would have known what was going down in Bethlehem. But he didn't know. He didn't know. Had to make a blanket discussion. See, the devil doesn't know everything. He's not God, and sometimes we make him God. He's not. He doesn't know what you're thinking until you tell him. Shut up. <laughs> Verse 5. She gave birth to... A male child, one who is destiny, the prophetic role, is to rule all the, come on, nations with a rod of iron, the restoration of order and fruitfulness and productivity. But her child was what? Caught up to God and to his throne, right at the right hand of the Father. And the woman now, she has to flee into the wilderness which is a place of preservation but also a place of turmoil and challenge as we know with the nation of Israel spending time in Israel in the, in the wilderness before entering the promised land yes. Amen. where she has a place prepared by God and if we are consistent with the woman being Israel we now know and understand that that was the dispersion of the nation of Israel because of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple which destroyed and put an end to the Jewish sacrificial system, which has not taken place since then. And God had to destroy that sacrificial system in order to replace it with the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So we take communion because the offering has already been made 2,000 years ago. He removed the violence and bloodshed and put it into the context of love, life, and light. And the woman fled into the wilderness and she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. We're not going to touch that. All right. Stay with me. Now war arose in heaven because now that this messianic individual is brought forth and now seated on the throne in a place of power and position and authority. What does it have to do now with the dragon? Now war arose in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And please get this picture out of these, these invisible spiritual beings with spiritual swords and shields and they're going at it. Ah! They don't die. They're different. They're incorporeal beings. They're, they're spiritual beings. Their essence is different. So don't picture that they're having a fight like you and I on a military battlefield. How many understand that? Their war is within a war of words and ideologies and the ability to influence the stage of human history for people to live out those ideologies. The Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy called it doctrines of devils. What is a doctrine of devil, King James language? I'm glad you asked. Demonically inspired rationalizations of men's minds. So I can rationalize sexual identity. I can rationalize how society should be organized. I can rationalize anything in rebellion against the order and authority of God. Because God has gifted me to reason. That's his gift to me. Amen. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called, come on, the devil. And Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now, listen to this, look at this, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God, our God, and the authority of his Christ have come. Where? Come to thee. You got it? Let's keep going. And then I'll, I'll map it out real quick in the time we don't have left. And they have conquered him by the, how did they conquer him? By the, verse 11, by the blood of the lamb. Who did they conquer? Satan. How did they conquer him? By the blood, the cross. The cross was his defeat. The apostle Paul said, had the powers of this world known, they wouldn't have crucified him. Because they were putting themselves to death. They were stripping themselves of their own power. And by the word of their testimony, and they lived out their lives even to death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens. Listen, rejoice, O heavens, who, you, you, who will, who, you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great what? Come on. Because he knows that his time is, come on, short. So the, 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 the intensity of the conflict between good and evil, the cosmic conflict, is now focused in the realm of human history and on the earth. And all of the forces at play are working out right here. Amen. And that's why we see such an acceleration in human history and human product productivity. And we can tell that things are getting closer and closer because of what we achieved in the last hundred years. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued, come on, he pursued the woman, not the nation of Israel, it didn't exist, because it's not the nation of Israel that make the Jews, it's the Jews that make the nation of Israel, because the Jews were scattered throughout every land over the last 2,000 years. And it's not until 1948 that they were regathered in the nation of Israel, but all Jews don't live in Israel. So it's not the political system because all human political systems are faulty. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? So we have a right to challenge the political system, whether it's being oppressive or or, or, or not. We have a right to political to, cha the, to challenge the political system whether it's doing the right thing for those in positions within their society. But you see, it's a people that are a continuity of the eternal plan and the redemptive history. Let's continue. Are you with me? Yes. I didn't plan on part three, so you tell me what you want me to do. Okay, verse 13. 
And I'm not going to go, to go too far. And when the dragon saw that he had but thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Got it? But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and time and a half time. That eagle does not represent the United States. The United States didn't exist when the Jews were dispersed at the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth. Words, ideologies, deceptions to sweep away with a flood. But the earth came to help, to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. And this is why in the, in the Jewish mind, what's important, what sustains Jewish life is making friends. Whether it's individually, communally, or on an international level. Because having friends is required and has been for its survival. And let me say this to you very quickly. Let's elevate the conversation to the place that God would have it. He would not have it be having a conversation in the realm of human, social, and political constructs. He would be having a conversation in the context of his word, which declares every human being to be the image of God and worthy of dignity, honor, respect, and value, whether Palestinian or Jew or Muslim or Christian or anybody else. That's the level that he is going to have the conversation. He's not going to bow to the political and social construct of human society. Because then he surrenders to human opinion. And God will not surrender to human opinion. He is the lawmaker. He is the judge. Verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. Became furious with the woman. Verse 17. Fears with a woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who else came out of that woman? I'm not talking Catholic, Protestant, Episcopalian. I'm talking about the great body of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that has spanned time and currently occupies the globe to the tune of two billion people. You've got Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, Orthodox. There's a whole gamut like the tree that he spoke of that would have many branches. But who is the devil persecuting? Who is Jesus said in the world you will have what? Tribulation. So who is the devil? He's down here now. Who is he after? Who is he after? Come on, let's read it. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And the word sea there, don't take it literally, as the ocean. No, in Revelation 17, 15, it expresses, it reveals that the sea is the collection of all humanity with all of its languages, nations, ethnicity, etc. That's the sea that it's talking about. And verse, chapter 13 is critical. Because then... The dragon elevates a beast, which is simply the name for a human leader. So now, as to chapter 12 speaks of these two entities, chapter 13 now introduces the power of the state. Political systems, social constructs, governments, on and on and on. In fact, I, I, I think I gave you a breakdown. Did I give you a breakdown last week? I think I did, right? Political systems, economic systems. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Get that 666 on your forehead and, your, and the back of your hand out of your mind. That is ridiculous. If he's a deceiver, that's the worst deception I, I could attempt at deception you could ever imagine. You make it obvious. Oh, six, six, six. <laughs> that's not deception. It's talking about the work of men's mind and the work of men's hands, which is what he uses. 
without the anointing of God, without the wisdom of God. That was the product of the flesh. So political systems, economic systems, social norms. And you know how powerful social norms are? You could have a, tr a truth, but if the social norm is a lie, guess what's going to dominate? Guess what's going to guide, control the language and the conversation and guide the narrative? The social norm, not the truth. And that's why he had to create a pillar and ground for the Competing ideologies, and boy, we've seen ideology, opinions uh, and, and ideas as the way society should be structured, the best way to live in it, and we come up with all of these ideas, and this is powerful, right? The fifth one that I gave you, collective intensity of special interest groups. That is a collective intensity, because as the group grows, not only in numbers, but in political and social influence, it begins to control the narrative within a society and shape a, reshape a culture. And that's all at work in America. So here you have what is called civic power. And guess what the devil is using in chapter 13? It's all about his entrance into civic power. Politics, economics, ideologies, social constructs, special interests. The devil is using all of that. And is God in there too? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a covenant relationship with the people to maintain an understanding of how it all started. This is important because if you don't understand yesterday, you'll be confused about today. And then we have this entity. And what did it say in Revelation 12? Now has come, where? To the earth. The kingdom of our God. The power and authority of his Christ. Oh, y'all are not hearing me. If these are the forces that are currently at work in human history and human society, they play a critical role. We understand this role, but we are short when it comes to understanding this role. Because we're the ones who are here to exercise the power of his kingdom and the authority of his Christ in the power of the name of Jesus to respond to all that's going on that the devil is busy with. He left his church as a witness to that power, a witness to the authority. And we've been through a lot. And what did he say? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Dominion versus domination. Dominion, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. I come that you might have life, that you might have it more, more abundantly. Domination. Peter, Satan seeks to have you and sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. What is God's response to the stability? Because when you hear people talk about what's going on in the Middle East anyway, what is their major concern? Stabilizing it. Because they know there's not going to be any peace. There can be no peace until the Prince of Peace himself comes and establishes order in human history. The government will be upon his shoulders. We're in this mix. We're in this mix. And we've been called to be light in the darkness. Love in an empty, loveless society. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. But the devil will keep you so busy worrying about your rent. You can't even witness to your neighbor next door. Because you're afraid that they're going to see you evicted. He keeps us majoring on the minors so that our prophetic awareness is suppressed. Because as long as it's suppressed, we don't think about how we can cooperate with what he's doing in the earth. Creatively, redemptively, prophetically, Amen. providentially. Can't think of it. But I'll tell you what. I believe we're in revival. I, get, I believe God is giving a wake-up call to his church. For the last three decades, we've been seeker-friendly, touchy-feely. Now it's time to get up off of our hallelujahs and begin to think critically about what's going on in society around us and the role that we play with the authority of Christ, the King, the power of his kingdom, and his word of reconciliation and healing. That's where we are. 
And that's the only thing, that's the only answer that we have. And people are hungry for the answer. But if we are making uncertain sounds, how do they know how to respond? Come on, let's all stand. I got to stop you. Woe to you preachers. We're simply entertaining the people to make them feel good for a minute so they can come back to feed that high next Sunday. How about equipping them, empowering them with wisdom and knowledge and understanding? My people are destroyed for lack of... We need to get back to making disciples, back to Bible study, back to the book back to discovering our gifts, talents, and abilities, the empowerment that he's given us. And I believe the church is in revival. Man, but all the sin in the world. Read the book. When sin abounds, grace does much, come on, much more abound. I'm not looking at the sin. I'm looking for the grace that's going to emerge. The grace and the truth working together with Jesus brought. I'm pumped about the next 10 years. I get to sow into the future by sowing into the present and the past. And I believe that we are ancient of God's change. How many believe? Why do you think we're called Christian Cultural Center? It's not called Spring Creek Church. It's because we understand the pattern. God takes his word. He sends his word to heal. But that word needs a body. So he takes that healing word, put it in a body, and then sends that body into the world. The world of government, the world of entertainment, finance, and athletes, you name it. That's the pattern. And that's where we are. Come on, slap high five with three people. Tell them I got that word today. So I'm hyped, amped, whatever other words I haven't learned yet. I've got to talk to my grandchildren. Update me. But this is the most exciting time to live. Throughout scripture, we are taught not to let the circumstances of the society and the culture determine our success. Again and again, God showed himself strong. If he's got to send a pillar of fire by night to light your path, he'll do it cloud by day, whatever is necessary. But ultimately, he wants you to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. Trusting him all the way, no matter what things look like, no matter what you hear. Let yourself be informed by the word of God so that God doesn't ask to ask you the question, who told you you were no good? Who told you you couldn't do that? Who told you you couldn't rise above it? I am what I am because God says I am. And that's my testimony. Can I pray over you? Father, thank you for this wonderful service today. Thank you for this community of faith. Thank you for their love for the truth, your word, by which you will sanctify us, distinguish us from the culture and all that is informed as culture. Because we've chosen not to be conformed to this world, but to be, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we can prove, witness, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will that comes from you. Bless us, we ask. Touch our families, all of the three areas that Satan comes in, our family, our finances, and our health. Put a hedge of protection around them all, Father, so we can stand strong. For the people who know they God, their God will do great things. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Man, I am so done. I'm going to ask Pastor Jamal to come up here. All right. Those are my notes. We're going to turn over to Misha real quick, and we're going to you know, make sure we touch all bases of the ministry.
We close every service by saying that Jesus is Lord. But we can't do that without giving someone the opportunity to make him Lord. In the words of a courtroom testimony, we are people of the book, the whole book, and nothing but the book. Which means that while we all have our own history, God's redemptive history should inform it. Nothing that we did and nothing that was done to us lies beyond the healing, restorative, redemptive power of God. God allows us to choose, but we must choose wisely. We can rationalize anything, but he calls us to reason with him. Some of us have voluntarily entered into slavery by choosing the bondage of idolatry, but God calls us to be free, and today we can be free. And that is good news. Can we give him praise? The good news is that a holy God so loved a rebellious world that he sent his only begotten son to live a sinless life, die in our place, and rise from the grave, conquering death. And in doing so, he paid the price for our sin and gives us a right to everlasting life. The good news is that he is a covenant-keeping God. If he said it, he's going to do it. The good news is that his timetable is not dependent on our ability to calculate days. He doesn't need us to figure it out. He needs us to occupy and remain faithful. Amen? Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you'd like to experience this love worth finding, I'd like to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you, to raise your hand. If you walked with God and walked away and thought you lost your chance to win, I'm talking to you. Just raise your hand. And if you are feeling a call to a new work or you are nurturing a fragile dream or perhaps mourning one that you think has died, I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to take one step of faith. Come down to this altar so that we, the church, can pray for you together. Let us applaud them. Let's encourage them as they come. I want to encourage someone today. God is calling you. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundant. Someone here today is wrestling with the spirit of condemnation. You may be struggling with your identity. You may be struggling with your life experience. And you may think that it has marred you to the point that you are beyond the reach of God. And I want to encourage you today that no one in here is beyond the reach of God. You think you're marked with some spiritual barcode and you are not. Today, you can come to Jesus. Today, you can be free. Today, you can be forgiven. Today, you can be made whole. Let us continue to encourage them. Someone in here is wrestling with a spirit of death. You've been obsessed with the idea that, that your best days are behind you. You're suffering with depression. You're suffering with a sense of defeat. You're suffering with a sense that, that, that you're going to get sick, that something bad is going to happen to you. But what I want to encourage you today is that something good is about to happen to you. And all you have to do is say yes to it. All you have to do is walk into a future that was ordained for you before the foundation of the world. Beloved, this is a moment. Let us continue to pray. This is a moment of surrender. And in surrender, there is strength. In surrender, there is power. In surrender, there is transformation. We have the opportunity to come into agreement today with a moment of surrender that will change everything. Beloved, I don't want anyone to miss this moment. There's one person I want to pray for right now. You're still stuck in your seat. You think that we're all looking at you, and maybe we are. You think that your neighbor is going to judge you, and maybe they are, but I don't want you to miss this opportunity to say yes to God. Miss this opportunity. This is way bigger than your pride. This is way bigger than your self-image. This is way bigger than any individual moment. This is about God's plan for your eternity. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we come to this altar with a hundred different burdens, but one almighty God. So wherever you are in your walk today, please pray this prayer with me. Father, thank you for this opportunity to receive your love. I repent 
of my sin. I believe Christ died on the cross to pay the price for my sin and rose again, conquering death. I confess him as Lord and Savior. And your word says, I'm born again. Thank you for grace and for mercy. Thank you that no matter how many times I fall, I can get back up. If I confess, you will wash me clean. Today, I will walk by faith and not by sight. Today, I will lay down my hurts and pick up hope. Today, I will lay down my doubt and pick up faith. Today, I will lay down my will and pick up your cross and follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God praise that his word is alive in this place? Family, we believe that if you prayed those prayers, you are born again, you are beginning the process of restoration, and you are ready to take new steps in the work. But change is not an event, it's a process. Wherever you are in this walk, I need you to do four things. One, begin to study the word. Two, get in a Bible teaching church. Three, tell someone about the decision you made today. And four, keep showing up. Give God praise. And if you are watching by our internet campus, please, we have some information we'd like to share with you. Please call or text your number on your screen. May God continue to bless you. Your life will never be the same. I sense a disturbance in the force behind me, so I'm going to decrease. Let the man of God increase. God bless you. You may return to your seats. Congratulations. And as you see these faces, you believers, pray for them. You don't need to know their names. Just as you watch the faces coming down, be excit showing excitement as the kingdom of God is growing and increasing. We're, we're closing today. I got a favor to ask. My favor is that can you please increase your prayer life? And that does not say that you don't have a good prayer life. But I'm asking you to just take it to another level. That's why I just, you know, praying and getting ready for today's service and just looking at the worship experience. Let's increase our prayer life. There's something that's going to happen as you increase your prayer life. You'll start seeing it manifest in different ways. So please just increase our prayer life. Amen? Amen. As we leave this place with never God's presence, Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you and enjoy the rest of your week. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.